So I, I did a 26-city tour of the United States last year, and it was a very interesting time to be over there. I was in North Carolina, reading the papers in the backyard with the guy who lived next door to where I was staying. It was the day that news first broke from Iraq of this united Sunni and Shia joint uprising against the US-led occupation. Same day, there was news of an African Union declaration condemning US foreign policy. And the guy next door said to me, I'll tell you this much about the United States, we are sure bringing about world unity. Because the one thing unites the entire planet, hatred of us. It's like y'all became one big nation called the rest of the world. And I said to him, well, actually, we did. In fact, we've even got our own flag. He went, oh, yeah? What is it? I said, same as yours, but on fire. <laughs> I was skip diving in Kentish town. And in this skip, I discovered a book called Marching to the Drums, From the Kabul Massacre to the Siege of Mafeking. And it was a fairly gung-ho military history full of stirring tales of colonial daring do in the British Empire's overseas campaigns from 1860 to 1902. So you've got a chapter on Gordon of Khartoum, Omdurman, Charge the Light Brigade. And at the top of each little chapter, there was this little introductory standalone paragraph in bold, just explaining what the British Army happened to be doing in Afghanistan, Egypt, Sudan. And because of the people who read gung-ho military histories like Marching to the Drums are really only interested in one thing, weapons. <laughs> weapons and maybe tactics, but on the whole, weapons. <laughs> there was a refreshing honesty candor and lack of hypocrisy about this little standalone introductory paragraph. With its opening in 1869, the Suez Canal became the principal waterway to Britain's most valuable overseas possession, India. It was therefore imperative for the British Army to control all traffic through the Suez Canal, which meant, first of all, crushing the indigenous independence movements of Egypt and the Sudan. <laughs> Now, the Webley automatic Gatling gun was able to fire 500 rounds a minute. This proved more than a match for the scimitar swords and wicker breastplates of the Mahdi army. <laughs> and this bull stating of the geopolitical facts of life strikes the modern reader with a force of revelation. For there is, in our own time, an absolute taboo among the corporate news media and the political class against mentioning anything to do with these strategic and economic reasons for war. As witness, just over a year ago, I'm listening to the Today programme on Radio 4, and there was this little phrase they kept repeating on the half hour, every half hour. The G8 has today endorsed an American plan to bring democracy to the Middle East. The G8 has today endorsed an American plan to bring democracy to the Middle East. The level of naivety necessary before you can talk about an American plan to bring democracy <laughs> To the Middle East, you will not find that level of naivety anywhere outside of 1970s porno films. <laughs> Gee, mister, you mean the time machine only works if I take off all my clothes? <laughs> the G8 has today endorsed an American plan to bring democracy to the Middle East. And which country were they discussing that particular morning? Why, Iran, of course! Which until 1953 was a secular democracy. In 1951, Mohammed Mossadegh elected Prime Minister by a landslide majority on a mandate of nationalising the Anglo-Persian oil company, now known as Record Profit Posting BP. What happens next? The Foreign Office recommend a coup d'etat. Churchill puts up a million and a half dollars to finance the coup. Eisenhower agrees to match this with a million dollars on the sole proviso that Theodore Roosevelt's grandson and CIA Middle East Station Chief in Tehran, Kermit Roosevelt, will be point man for the coup. This is agreed, the money's transferred, and Kermit Roosevelt's first action is to spring General Fazlollah Zahidi from jail, where he is languishing on account of being a Nazi collaborator. But this is the man that Kermit Roosevelt has chosen to lead the military part of the coup. Incidentally, I hope you're all impressed by the way I'm just letting the whole Kermit angle slide. <laughs> For I feel that other comedians would not have had the self-discipline to walk away from that rich storehouse of comedic possibility. 
but would instead have become mesmerised by a mental comedy graph whose x-axis was Middle Eastern politics and whose y-axis was children's TV programmes of the 1970s <laughs> and would have attempted to plot the intersection points and asymptotes thereon. But I feel that, yes, we could have that laugh, but at a terrible psychic cost. <laughs> which would be that from here to the end of the show, there would be a tinny, hollow sound to the laughter and a collective shared sense of disappointment. <laughs> of the spectrum of possibility having been brutally diminished. And we got through the show fine, like any other, and gone our separate ways, but there would have been this sense, perhaps on a pre-conscious level, but real, <laughs> nonetheless, of disappointment. And it would all have been traceable back to this moment, <laughs> had we gone down that particular comedic pathway, which is why we shall not be taking <laughs> that particular... That said, however, <laughs> be advised, I shall shortly be using the phrase puppet regime. <laughs> I don't want to get overexcited or to overreact in any way. You are a sophisticated, more for audience. You will credit me that that is the given socio-political terminology, the only accurate phraseology wherewith to describe how Kermit Roosevelt installed Shah Reza Pahlavi's absolute dictator of Iran, head of the notorious Savak secret police, which in 1976, he's still there, Amnesty described as responsible for the worst human rights atrocities on planet Earth. This was Britain and America bringing democracy to the Middle East in 1953 style. Yes, but that was then. This is now. Now there's an American plan, endorsed by the G8, I might add, to bring democracy to the Middle East generally, not just in Iran, but in Iraq. Where the United States is building 14 permanent U.S. military bases on Iraqi soil. What's so profound is the corporate news media's acquired naivety, the learnt ability not to see or hear the uncomfortable fact that they could be interviewing a four-star U.S. general while he is laying bricks on the very building site of one of these U.S. military bases and still notice nothing wrong. There's the general going, that's right. As soon as the Iraqis have an election, we're out of here. Don't worry about that. Just wait for them to vote for us to leave. We're gone. <laughs> They vote to turn this $4 billion base into a youth club. We'll just swallow that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I can't help feeling that this bit would work better if my bricklaying mime looked less like the gayest 17th century French fop <laughs> playing a game of Gaylord tennis or <laughs> dandy racquetball. <laughs> Have a you, sir? No, you. <laughs> the rules of Gaylord tennis is the first player to produce a bead of perspiration loses. <laughs> Lord Fauntleroy, your brow perspires, methinks. And no, that is a sequin from your mother's breast. <laughs> My point. Ah, uh, no, for points are further deducted for appearing to care about the result. Scoring is bourgeois. <laughs> An American plan to bring democracy to the Middle East. And the reason they can foist such phrases upon us daily is because the British are unique among nations in their naivety about geopolitics, about the strategic and economic reasons for war, because we are unique among nations in our ignorance about our own history. How curious, for example, that the First World War is never taught in our schools as an invasion of Iraq. Not all of you are coming with me on that one. That's OK, don't worry. I will say many things in the course of tonight's show that you will not agree with. I will say, for example, people who fly short haul should be ASBO. <laughs> Climate criminals that you are. I shall call for 100 hours community service for eating fruit out of season. Be calling for a mandatory carbon ration of 10 kilos per person per annum. Arguing that the dissolution of the corporations is the sine qua non of democracy and that the First World War should be taught in our schools for the invasion of Iraq it was. I will say many things in the course of tonight's show that you will not agree with. I will say, for example, the First World War should be taught in our schools as an invasion of Iraq. And here's where we began to part company. But I feel that if we retrench back to a position of consensus, we can build outwards from there. So going back to where I believe some consensus to exist between us. Possibly. 
I am sure many of you, like me, have never been entirely satisfied with the standard explanation we were given at secondary school for the causes and origins of the First World War. The assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. I mean, no one is that popular. <laughs> Lovely fellow, he helped when my car broke down and when the DJ didn't show up my sister's wedding, he went home, got his own records, played all night, wouldn't take a penny. And every Sunday there he'd be refereeing the disabled basketball. <laughs> a somewhat more efficient cause might be the Berlin Baghdad Railway commenced construction in the years leading up to the First World War. The Royal Navy had just switched from coal to oil. German Navy follows suit, but they don't have no oil-producing colonies, no place in the sun. Thus begins Drang nach Osten, the drive to the east, spine of which policy is the Berlin-Baghdad Railway. Now, there's already track laid from Berlin to Constantinople, of course, it's called the Orient Express. The Germans just have to build the last 900 clicks. It's going to take them clear into Baghdad, but there is huge opposition to this project among the major European powers, the Russians, the French, the Dutch, the Belgians, and the British. We're opposed to this for two main reasons. Firstly, we recognise that we cannot compete with the Germans in engineering terms alone, because we know that passengers will simply not accept the Sarajevo to Basra replacement bus service. <laughs> Secondly, we know once this is built, ain't nothing to stop a Munich businessman getting out of the Baghdad terminus with a Deutsche Bank checkbook smashing our cartel. So a phony war begins. Churchill, who is Minister for War and Air, dispatches to the Gulf Sidney Riley, who's described in one leading textbook of the period as... I'm quoting now, probably the most famous spy of the early 20th century. Now, call me naive about international <laughs> espionage, but if you are the most famous spy, you are the worst. <laughs> and so it proves, Sidney Riley arrives in the Gulf with J-Lo and Beyonce on either arm, the paparazzi are there, flashbulbs pop. War breaks out because it's a war to defend plucky Belgian neutrality, remember, while the Belgians are pluckily defending Congolese rubber and ivory, the first British regiment to be deployed in the First World War, the Dorset Regiment goes to Basra, 1914, where it is joined by 51 other British divisions. Now, if you go onto the Dorset Regiment's website, I have way too much free time. <laughs> Plenty of gunnery about the first battalion of the Dorsets going to Mons in 1914. Nothing. Not a word about the second battalion of the Dorsets going to Basra in 1914. And therefore, my friends, I believe we may conclude with some confidence that had Wilfred Owen or Siegfried Sassoon fought by the Tigris or the Euphrates instead of by the Somme, we would never have heard of them. They could have sent truckloads to the front full of nothing but poets. If they'd fought in Iraq in the First World War, we would not know of a single man jack them. Why? There could even have been a first special poets battalion. But had it fought in Iraq, we would never have known of its existence. Although one can't help feeling that the first special poets battalion would have been wiped out quite early on in the hostilities. <laughs> <laughs> there you are in the map room of the Turco-German HQ in the Jaff. And the general's there saying, if the special poets battalion decides to pitch camp here, they cut our supply lines in two. Have access to the strongest partisan militias or under a rocky canopy providing a natural defense from aerial bomber. Fortunately, however, they have decided to pitch camp here, where dappled shade falls on rusted farm equipment entwined with bougainville, near an almond grove where walks a young shepherd boy of unblemished complexion. OK, OK, I want to take the mood down now, so can you cycle a bit slow? Too slow, can take it up a bit? Down a bit. Okay, that's it. Okay. And the reason the First World War is not taught in our schools for the invasion of the Iraqi wars is because your good war, your just war, has always been presented as a one off, a discrete event, no more connected to other wars than consecutive productions in the same musical. Because otherwise, all the just war, good cause, humanitarian arguments, they begin to unravel if ever a war is seen to be part of a continuous foreign policy 
that has remained absolutely consistent for decades. In the 95 years since Mesopotamian oil was first struck at Masjidi Suleiman, and a British lieutenant sent a telegram to the Glasgow office of Burma Oil, which read, See Psalm 104, verse 15, line 3, which is, of course... <laughs> See, now, when I did my gig in Texas, the entire audience, as one, roared out... <laughs> That he may bring out of the earth oil to make a cheerful countenance. In the 95 years since that telegram was deciphered in Glasgow, Britain has been at war with or occupying Iraq for 45 of them. Now, if you're a broadcaster, a journalist looking for a neutral, objective, analytical, coldly rational, ideologically uncluttered way to describe that reality, the phrase you're looking for will be something about British and American plans to bring democracy to the Middle East. Some kind of psalm singing is called for, some raising of hosannas to our benevolence. Which is why, when they asked me to go on question time, I said no. Because on that show there's this uh, rigid adherence to a dogmatic, entirely fictitious version of world events. And if you step outside it, you're just off the spectrum, they can't even hear you. And if I went on question time, there'd be a real danger that I'd just come across as some sort of anarchist nutter. <laughs> <laughs> well, allow me to elucidate with reference to specifics. Why, for example, to go on question time and say, if the Nuremberg Law was applied, Tony Blair would be hung. They'd lose their mind. This is rhetoric, offensive, sloganeering, nonsense, ab empirically true fact, by the way. <laughs> what they were hung for at Nuremberg was, quote, planning and waging an aggressive war, full stop. No human being was tried for genocide on planet Earth until 1996 when the post Habi Ramina Hutu power were put on the stand in Kigali. What they were hung for at Nuremberg was planning and waging an aggressive war. Yes, but it's still offensive sloganeering, just nonsense. Of course, we know in all seriousness. Of course, Blair can't actually be a war criminal, can he? Of course, Tony Blair. I mean, Tony Blair can't be a war criminal. I mean, he listens to Oasis. And he can't be a war criminal because we know what war criminals look like. And they look like Goebbels. <sighs> but what did Goebbels look like to the Germans? Well, you know, we're a modernising party. We've broken the mould of German politics. <laughs> and, and sometimes it's better to be on the losing side for the right reasons than to be on the winning side for the wrong reasons. I know, of course, that the war has caused deep divisions in the country. But I also know we are faced with the real problem of global terrorism, which is not simply going to go away, much as we may wish it. And the only way we can deal with this problem is to kill and maim in Iraq in a war that Kofi Annan describes as illegal. Because I tell you this, you know, if there is any other way at all of uniting the forces of secular Arab nationalism with those of militant Islam, then, you know, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> there is also a real problem of word fatigue. I mean, people should realise when we're talking about chemical and biological agents, we're not just talking about, you know, washing powders and detergents. He actually said that to feel the contempt. <laughs> and that is classic <laughs> new labour psychology. When they ain't citing false consciousness, it's projection and trans. Ah. Ooh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know what that is? No, I saw it. Yeah, Am I? Are you the sound man asking me that? <laughs> yeah, for a moment, I think there was weird moments during a show when the sound guy or the lighting guy actually stopped playing their Atari and, the, <laughs> and then, like, a really high score at Tetris and, like... Oh, right. and they Where were we? Um... Um, yeah, word fatigue, word fatigue. Classic new labour psychology, projection and transference. So it was us in 2003 who had the problem with word fatigue. OK, us, OK, not then us. And yet we know from our own life experience what word fatigue is, right? It's not a phrase I'd use myself, ugly phrase, but I guess I know what they mean, right? Word fatigue, that feeling when the tongue becomes a wooden clapper and a cardboard bell as you hear yourselves reciting a mantra you ain't never believed, no longer believe. I love you. Yes, I'm having a great time, dear. The W, the M and the D. By way of... Psychological contrast, the opposite of word fatigue might be 
The joyful exuberance of at last uttering the truth which has for too long been suppressed might, for example, be the Times headline of July the 20th, 2002. And the Times, by the way, brilliant newspaper. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> every now and then it forgets that there are certain things you are not supposed to mention. <laughs> and it just gets carried away. And the headline on that date was, West sees glittering prizes ahead in giant Iraqi oil fields. <laughs> Sorry, I was not supposed to mention that. Sorry, it's just so exciting. See, there's these three giants on North Force, Marge, Du Naram, our West Coast, and the regular first, who are good for 700,000 brows a day, but okay, mum's a word, so I'll say another thing. 220 billion brows of chemical weapons, not as good as a week to a blind man, know what I mean, Governor. Just because there is this uh, fashionable taboo among the political class and the corporate news media against mentioning the economic reasons for war don't mean we should obey it. And so I should therefore like to offer you my Euro-dollar theory for the war in Iraq. I'm not saying this is the reason for the invasion, I'm saying it's a reason. Clearly part of a nexus of multiple weakly acting causal pathways. That's my new catchphrase. <laughs> to understand the reasons for the invasion, You've got to go back to a 1971 OPEC meeting at which the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries did decree that from this day forth, wheresoever a barrel of oil is bought or sold anywhere in the world, it may only be bought or sold in US dollars. Mexico, selling oil to China, US dollars. Holland, trading oil futures into Morocco, U.S. dollars, even though the more natural currency for that particular transaction would, of course, be hashish. <laughs> <laughs> this 1971 agreement gives the Federal Reserve a licence to print money, because everybody has got to buy dollars to buy oil. It's how come the U.S. can be the number one debtor nation in the world today, and it don't matter. Because since 1971, the US dollar has been a magic checkbook. Imagine you are maxed out way past your overdraft limit at every branch of every bank in the world, have been for the last 34 years, and it didn't matter. Everybody still took your checks, and best of all, they never came back to the bank. A magic checkbook. By way of analogy, the only other example I can think of from real life of an actually existing magic checkbook would be from the last years of the life of Salvador Dali when he never had to pay for anything, only had to pretend to pay thanks to his magic checkbook. What would happen in his last years, and this is absolutely true, in his final decade, Salvador Dali used to walk into the finest restaurants in Andalusia and Catalonia and sit at a great big long table with all his acolytes and they'd order all the, all the very finest, most expensive items from the menu. Caviar, quail's eggs, brandy, armagnac, cognac, if indeed those are not all the same thing. <laughs> Arctic roll. <laughs> Lobsters, langoustines, champagne, cigars, end of the evening. The owner would say, Signor Dali, the bill. Signor Dali, your bill. And Dali would take the bill, eight billion pesetas, no pressure. He'd get out his magic checkbook. Right, eight billion pesetas, sign it, date it, pop. Just before he handed the cheque back to the owner, he'd flip it over, and on the reverse, Dali used to do a drawing, sign it, and then hand it to the owner. Senor Dali, you do me a great honour. A signed original from the maestro? I will never cash this cheque. <laughs> I will frame it and mount it here on the wall of my restaurant and anyone who comes in will know that the great Salvador Dali did. Of course, next morning the restaurateur is on eBay for sale. One signed Salvador Dali. Is <laughs> well, that's okay too, because those checks are going around the world, never returning to Banco Santander. Imagine, however, as is long overdue incidentally, an influential caucus of art critics led by Brian Sewell and Robert Hughes were to walk into an art gallery one day, walk up to some Salvador Dali paintings, Look at them, look at each other and go, Salvador Dali. He's not very good, though, is he? Because <laughs> he's not. 
Im call himself a surrealist, but he misses the authentic note of dreams every time. Which is that among the rich and strange there must always be the humdrum and the everyday, yes, the dripping watch, yes, the giant egg thing. But between them all, I contend, there must always be Björk getting off a number 73 bus saying, Look, Robert, I have found the Prince Buster like what you've been looking for. But oh no, the vinyl is made of custard. What shall we do? Quick, we must have sexual intercourse to make it solid again. <laughs> After this critical pronunciation, the value of signed Dali originals collapses on eBay. All across Andalusia and Catalonia, restaurateurs say, I take it down, Dali, you know, eight billion pesetas. And from all over Spain, all these checks start flocking back to Banco Santander. And Dali don't have funds to cover them because he spent all the money on giant mechanical herons. <laughs> so he has to get a job in Britain as a house painter, interior decorator. So Magnolia, you say? <laughs> you want maybe I get artistic and regular a little? Just ma Maybe a man, the Magnolia. I do a goat with an eye of a million, and inside... Magnolia. Milita. Magnolia. <laughs> OK, so what could possibly happen to the magic checkbook of the US dollar to make all those greenbacks? Flock home to Manhattan and the buck stop there. Well, compañeros, compañeras. It almost happened. On the 30th of October, in the year of our Lord, 2000, when a switch was made to a single deposit account in the Wall Street branch of unfortunately named French bank BNP. And this was the UN-administered account through which the Iraqis were selling 2.3 million barrels per day under oil for food. And on October 30th, the Iraqi said, we would like to switch this from being a dollar-denominated account to a euro-denominated account. And the UN said, well, we can't stop you, but we've got to tell you, you are fools to yourselves, because right now the euro ain't worth but 80 cents. You are going to lose money on every barrel you sell. You may bankrupt your entire country within a year. The Iraqi said, we don't care. We'll take the risk. We cannot bear to touch the enemy's currency. Make the switch. And at the end of 2000, the switch is made from dollars to euros. And then what happens? In 2001, the euro gains 25% against the dollar thanks to strong sales of moon safari by air. <laughs> Thus forcing the Iranians to switch their central bank reserve funds from dollars to euros. Axis of Evil member number two. December 7, 2002, North Korea declares it's going to do all its commodity trading from now on, not just oil, not in dollars, but in euros. Axis of Evil member number three. And then Hugo Chavez, re-elected president of Venezuela. Chairmanship of OPEC falls to him. Same year, he convenes an OPEC meeting in Spain in April, and on the table is the proposal that every single petroleum exporting country unilaterally switches from dollars to euros. And that is the Federal Reserve's worst nightmare. Because if that happens, every central bank of every country in the world has to flush all the dollars out of its vaults to buy euros. The international money market becomes glutted with dollars, their value collapses, everyone evacuates the New York Stock Exchange and the US is back. Once again, in this nightmare Dust Bowl depression of the 1930s, only this time without a strong trade union busting Nazi Germany to invest in. Hitler comes to power from 29, takes power in 33. US corporate investment declines everywhere on continental Europe apart from one country, Nazi Germany, where between 1929 and 1940 it increases by 48.5%. That's almost 50% on a graph. That'd be like this. <laughs> Ford, ITT, International Harvester, IBM, <laughs> Union Banking Corps, General Motors. So, if the countries of the world start buying and selling oil in euros, not dollars, it's the collapse of US capitalism. You've got to nip that in the bud, and to stop it catching on, you've got to make an example of someone. 
Therefore, I believe we may begin to imagine the war in Iraq as a very public punishment beating. You have to imagine the world as a Bronx housing project and the US as the number one crack dealing mafia don on the block. Anybody wants to buy rock in this neighborhood, you better come to me. Otherwise, you can end up like that fucking guy over there. Take a good look, everybody. <laughs> and it's right after Operation Desert Fox. Everyone's watching as Iraq comes limping back to his first day at work at the petrol station. And he lifts the drop lock shutters and he gets to the PA system in the forecourt and says, OK, everybody. <sighs> come to me. I sell rock and they crack to everybody. I don't care. <laughs> and leaning out of the Andes tower blocks, third floor balcony, Venezuela. Bolivia and Peru are looking down, and Venezuela calls down to America. Eh, hey, compañero, I thought you said you had this neighborhood under control. <laughs> hey, don't make me come up there and deal with you. You tried that last week, my friend. You could not get up these stairs. <laughs> Maybe I come down there to you. You do that. Right now, I got business to take care of. And he always gets his boys, gets the boys on a baseball bat. And they go up to Iraq, and they get him out of here. And they drag him into the arc like the petrol station forecourt. Okay, everybody, take a good look at this guy. Iran, Syria, you're watching. Brazil. Maybe you're thinking about not implementing the IMF austerity package. Take a good look at this guy. See what happens next. <laughs> Damn, and they bloody believe rock trample him into the dirt, cut off his ears, and when the dust settles, the United States is leaning on his bloody, bespattered, splintered baseball bat, getting his breath back. And Venezuela, meanwhile, has come down to the petrol station forecourt. And it's walking around America. That fight took it out of you, compañero. Ten years ago, you take this guy, you don't even break sweat. This time, I gotta tell you, I don't think you could have taken him out of here. If it was not for the help of your little friend. You mean this bitch? Well, you know, when he says bitch, what he really means, of course. <laughs> Shut up! Shut up! I got this neighborhood under control! At which point a high end I driven by North Korea speeds past there's to America! You were saying, compañero, about control, I could not hear because someone was shouting dead to America very loudly in my ear. Would you care to repeat for me? You want a piece of me? Anytime you like. Okay, let's go and scrap the fight and hear this noise. Hey, look up, here comes China. Is there a problem? No, no problem at all, sir. No problem at all. We owe you $149 billion. Keep buying those dollars to buy all. No problem at all. A little local difficulty. Everything taken care of. Everything under control. I just felt I couldn't get all that across on one answer and question time. <laughs> Here's how shallow I am. For all the fascinating, terrifying, things happening in China. I just can't get my head past this one central fact of Chinese political life, which is that the president of China is called Hu Jintao, and the prime minister of China is called Wen Jiabao. So the president is Hu, and the prime minister is Wen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a marvellous early 20th century vaudeville routine. <laughs> Who's prime minister of China? No, Wen's prime minister. Who's president? That's what I'm asking. That's what I told you. Wen, no, Wen's prime minister. I know Wen's prime minister. I want to know who's president. Who's president? Who's the guy? Who's the guy? You got it. What I got? I got nothing. I just told you. Wen, no, Wen's prime minister. Don't start that again. He was sucking a jaw. You and who's army? That's what I want to know. about to enter a whole new era with peak oil. Petroleum geologists predict at some point between 2006, 2010, we will pass the planetary peak oil spike. And from then on, with every year, there will be less and less net energy available to humankind, no matter what we do. And this is, I believe, an epoch of such enormity that to make any meaningful comparison at all. You've got to go back to the Mayans, to the Romans, and the collapse of the last complex civilizations. Because those civilizations, they didn't collapse just because people got bored of being Mayans and Romans. The high priest didn't come out onto the temple steps at Chichen Itza, one solstice, giving it, hey -ya, hey -ya, hey -ya, hey -ya, hey -ya. Oh, this is bollocks, isn't it? <laughs> What's that, my dear? 
And the Roman Empire didn't end just because they got bored of being Romans. In the last days of Rome, you only about 30 people showing up at the Colosseum and their gladiators' hearts weren't in it. And they're like... <laughs> Even the lions are bored. <laughs> Most of the gladiators ended up playing Gaylord tennis. <laughs> but the scoring was fiendishly difficult because the hot Italian sun made perspiration inevitable, no matter the sang of the individual dandy racketeer. But with civilizations collapsed because their strategies for energy capture became subject to the law of diminishing returns. Now, there's a brilliant book out in a minute about peak oil called The Party's Over. Oil, war and the fate of industrial societies. Although I sometimes suspect that it's because my own life is so empty that I'm powerfully attracted to a book whose title is The Party's Over. <laughs> Yeah, Jude Law, swanning around the globe with all your actress girlfriends. Well, I'm afraid to have to tell you the party's over. <laughs> and all you young people driving away in the nightclub discotheques, going home and having free love, excuse me while I take the needle off the record. <laughs> the party's over. <laughs> and Richard Heinberg, who wrote The Party's Over, his thesis is, look, the name we gave to the world that first coal and then oil made is industrial society. When we pass the peak oil spike and oil depletes rapidly, it is the collapse of industrial society. And that faced with this enormous fact, this elephant in the room, humans are in denial, looking as ever for the quick techno fix. But there is no way out. Not this time, but we are suckers and we need to believe. Like the victims of every contract ever played, we need to believe, but there is no way. Well, we run out of oil, we go to the hydrogen economy, but there are no hydrogen reservoirs. Beneath the Thames Valley, you make hydrogen fuel cells from fossil fuel cells. You can use hydrogen fuel cells to store wave and wind. It's not useless, but it's not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. No way out. Well, we run out of oil, we go to the nuclear option. Well, apart from everything else is the small matter. That from mining to decommissioning, the nuclear cycle as a whole produces 75% as much carbon emissions as coal-fired gas stations non-starter. No way out! I don't want to bum you out totally. There are some hopeful technologies, credit where it's due. I mean, not enough people are investing in these technologies, but, OK, they're there. If you must have cars in the future, they can be powered by zinc air fuel cells, uh, which produce a non-toxic byproduct, the zinc oxide, which is a kind of viscous, thick, creamy white substance, which can be recycled into fresh zinc fuel pellets using electrolysis and walnut oil. And the catalyst that they're developing at Stanford University is thermobroma cacao, or coca solids. So the car of the future will drive along, powered by zinc air fuel cells, and out the back, on a little tray, will be produced a row of this thick, creamy white substance surrounded by a chocolate whirl with a walnut on the top. <laughs> there is no way out. <laughs> and transport is the least of our concerns. There is the small matter of the oil we eat. Since the 1960s, food is oil. In 1944, the average American farm produced 2,300 calories of food energy for every calorie of fossil fuel energy went into the field. In 1974, historically, that ratio became one to one. In our own time, thanks to nitrogen fertilizers, oil-based pesticides, refrigeration and four-figure food miles, it's 2,000 to one reverse. So you'd think, wouldn't you? The lead item on every new show every night would be, how are we going to feed ourselves now that the oil is running out? There's a very timely book out at the minute called Who Will Feed China? Wake Up Called for a Small Planet. Although, personally, I think they're asking the wrong question. The question should, of course, be, when will feed China? <laughs> Who's going to feed South America? Who's going to feed Europe? Big questions no one's asking. There's only one place I know on this planet doing any research into this, the Ecology Institute in Willits, California. And their statistical modelling starts on the assumption 
that there will be 7.5 billion of us on this planet in the middle of the 21st century. Okay, this being so, they ask, what then is the minimum amount of land per person we would need to devote to agriculture to support a population that size? And the figure they come up with, 2,800 square foot per person. Doable. I should say, however, that their statistics are based on a strictly vegan diet, biointensive farming, and the composting of all plant and human waste, including post-mortem humans. A somewhat skanky concept at first, I'll grant you. <laughs> but I think in time it could develop its own dignity and gravitas, especially if the rich and famous lead the way. A year from now, you go into the Vatican Garden and there's one of the cardinals standing next to a huge cylindrical composting drum saying, well, it's a year now since Pope John Paul II sadly passed away. So let's give him a turn. <laughs> oh, look at that. He's mulched up lovely for a tough, leathery old bird. <laughs> let's spread this rich biomass over the cabbages and beetroot so beloved in his native homeland. Oh, Glasgow Rangers tattoo. He kept that quiet. And I ain't talking about something that may happen at some point in the future one day. The most every country that ever produced oil has already had the big rollover, already passed its peak of domestic oil production. Colombia, 2004. Britain, 2002. Venezuela, 2000. Trinidad and Tobago, 1977. Iran, 76. And the USA, 1970. Three years later, the House Subcommittee on Foreign Relations publishes a report called Oil Fields as Military Objectives, a Feasibility Study, now known as an American plan to bring democracy to the Middle East. But I ain't saying the Americans is more evil than anybody else because they ain't. They just got the capability. I have no doubt, for example, that in 1977, Trinidad commissioned its own report called Oil Fields as Military Objectives. Tell us, what is the full strength of our Navy? Would that be including jet skis, sir? <laughs> yes. And of course, catch, 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 22 is the very worst fate that could befall humanity and all the other little species is the discovery of huge new reserves of oil beneath the tundra or the burning into the sky of what's already known about because the climate chaos that would unleash would make the mere collapse of industrial society a sideshow bagatelle. Therefore, since we've got to make the switch from oil anyway, why not do it now, while we've got an electricity grid that works 24 hours a day to work by, while we have cash from the energy windfall of the 70s to invest in renewables and in changing the whole shape of everything? Or we can spend this money sending battleships out to capture the dwindling deposits of the last hours of ancient sunlight. But to make the switch from oil now would take a World War II collective effort on behalf of the citizenry. Would mean, for once in our lives, getting off our asses and doing something. Us, not politicians, us. Now, when I first started getting involved with radical, direct action, non-hierarchical, eco-autonomous grassroots organizations, I didn't understand the concept of no leaders. I thought I did, but I didn't. And I got to the nearest alpha male or alpha female and say, here's what you should be doing. Why don't you do this? It'd be great if you all did this. Be, when, when are you going to do this? And they give me this look that I never understood, which was kind of, I think, weird. And I got to the next alpha. When are you going to do this? It'd be great if you did this. Why, why, why haven't you done this yet? Yeah, be, when are you going to do this? It'd be wonderful. Why, why don't you do this? And again, I get, they'll give me this look. Like, and I, after a year, the penny dropped, and I finally realised what that look meant, because they won't tell you, because that would be hierarchical, right? So, but I finally realised <laughs> that what this look meant, what the look meant was, yes, good idea, why don't you do it yourself? You print the leaflets, I'll distribute them. You call a meeting, I'll attend. You organise an action, we'll come along. And from the moment I realised that, my whole philosophical outlook changed. And from then on, instead of suggesting things that other people could do, I stopped suggesting things altogether in case I'd be expected to do them. <laughs> so, just before we all split up into small groups, <laughs> our revels now are ended. It's 
So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much.